Hello, people. What's going on? Let's get our camera calibrated to point in the right direction. Let's get our mouse woke up. We are the robots. I actually don't have good snacks right now. Well, I do. I have I have a marshmallow dream bar, and that's all you need. And if we run out of that, or uh, if we decide it's not spicy enough, I have two things of Chick-fil-A barbecue sauce. And a Redbird handcrafted candy to go on top. And then some vitamin D3. That's that's the snacks that I have. Do I have any experience or thoughts on trace-based JIT compilers? I think that's a complete waste of time. No, it's, I don't think it's a severely neglected technology. I think it doesn't make any sense. I think the, the thesis that you can optimize something effectively at runtime based on usage patterns uh, is not correct. Not, um, I mean, it's equivalent, like doing that well is equivalent to solving general AI because yeah, I don't know. Like, like this idea that you could like just take leaf functions and tune them for different things and you're going to come out ahead. It's just not true. Like, don't even bother. It falls into the category of one of these things that sounded good and then people tried it and it didn't really work out and people who were honest noticed it didn't work out and then other people just kept hyping it. It's like garbage collection. <laughs> Is that the horror book I've got open? Um, yeah, what are my goals with that book? I just want to read it for background again. Um, cause I know what the basic idea of this is, but I want to, I want to maybe skim it and not read it that carefully. Um, I don't think this is the right paradigm for doing, uh, multi-threaded systems, at least not ones that perform well, but this is like a lot of people refer back to this and think this is good. So, you know, I just sort of need to at least, at least read it and know what my beefs with it are and that kind of thing. You were chasing this bug in your compiler where writing a simple infinite loop was causing a 400 millisecond stall when writing the executable to disk. Turns out it was Windows Defender somehow running your program to check for viruses. Disabling it made the compile time go down to 4 milliseconds. Um, I just usually run with Windows Defender disabled because it totally destroys your computer so, um, who knows? What would a socialism language be? Uh, I mean, depends on which, which, in which dimensions it's socialist, right? I guess you're just really impressed with what you see from Luigi. It seems like it's only ever retrofitted on to slow things to make them faster instead of trying to make something that works well with it. Impressed, impressed how? That's sort of my question there. What, what impresses you about the idea that you could jit a scripting language and it'll get faster? Of course. 
if you compile something instead of running it interpreted, it'll get faster, right? Like everybody's known that since the beginning of time. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's impressive as opposed to obvious, but I haven't followed Luigi that closely. So maybe they really do something amazing. I don't know. Meanwhile, I will get water. So I have this bug that someone reported where if you assert during compile time execution, we infinite loop reporting the bug. That's not great. Um, but I think, I'm not sure which stack trace this is. I think this is the I think this is this one. I'm going to prove it by putting some dashes there because we we have that string in the compiler as well. Whoops, let me stop it faster. No, not that fast. I could have put it through more or something. Yeah, so it is this stack trace. So what's going on is um, I think our top level context.stackTrace, the next pointer, um, points at itself for some reason. Like when we set it up for a run directive, um, we don't ever let it be null for some reason. So that's just a mistake there. We will fix that. Are there resources? No, everybody always asks what I recommend for writing a compiler. I, I don't really have recommendations. I don't know of anything good to read about writing a compiler. Every time you see CSP, you think Rob Pike. Yeah, I mean, he has this Go talk that he gave at GoConf or whatever that everybody refers to that I, I don't super like, but it's because I don't like CSP. Okay, where do we set this up? Do I actually set it up? Like, I'm just trying to figure out stack trace next pointer offset. That is the one.
Okay, let's look for what emits the context, maybe. Default context. There we go. That's a thing. Set up default context. That is what we would do when creating a run directive. Luajit's impressive for just how fast it manages to make Lua and also how its FFI works. But no, I mean, that just means the scripting language was slow, right? Like, it's not like a Lua is astonishingly high level. Like, Lua is not like Prolog or something, right? So, uh, like, okay, yeah, you, you took something that was not a, that fast of a language and you made it fast by compiling it. That's like expected. That's not impressive, right? I, I, I'm, I want you to raise your standards about what's impressive, I guess. It gets absurdly close to CN speed, maybe, uh, but don't trust don't trust benchmarks like that. They're usually they're usually not good. They're usually uh, not correct, right? People will tell you that JavaScript is within 2x of C if you hit the fast path. It's not really true, but the benchmarks say it's true. If it were really true, then websites would be tremendously faster than they are, which is how you know it's not true. It CFFI interfaces seamlessly into JIT code and allows you to combine C and Lua. But again, that's just having a C foreign function interface like many programming languages do. I just don't, I mean, maybe if you haven't looked at other programming languages, that sounds astonishing or so. It's just normal. It's normal that you can call C. <laughs> like, that's just a thing, right? Um, I mean, it, it sounds great if you're a Lua enthusiast and you want Lua to go faster and all. Like, that's great, right, that it goes faster, but... Um, My listener of Lex Friedman's podcast, yeah, sometimes. He's starting to put out a lot more podcasts, too, so I kind of don't listen to him, a lot of them because you just can't, right? You ever thought about writing a blog with comments? Like, I already do way too many things. If people want me to do more things. I'm like, I can't. I have to set up the default context. How can I write a blog? Okay. Let me make sure the heat's on in here. It claims that we're at 74, but I do not think I believe it. Okay, so we add the stack trace node here. We allocate it We set the whole thing to zero.
It's a completely zeroed out stack trace node. So we must mess up we must mess up the next pointer somewhere. What was it called? is bothering me. Why? Why would we set it to itself ever. See, this is a sort of thing that would be easy if we didn't have ASLR. We could just start it up and set a data breakpoint on the memory location, but I can't do that. I've thought about starting a monastery. Believe me. I have thought about it. Oh yeah. You can disable ASLR, yeah, uh, try it. It's not that easy. It's a linker option that is not honored. Try it. Okay. Next best thing is a Texas ranch. You know, I think I would much rather be in Tennessee than Texas by comparing from comparing the two places. I rather like Tennessee better. There might be some other state I would like even more, but I have not been to all the states. What do I like about Tennessee better? The people are friendlier. Um, the city parts of Tennessee are not like a giant maze of gas stations and Chick-fil-A's. Like they actually have some character. Um, and then there's plenty of open land and nature and stuff. And the weather's better in Tennessee as well. Okay. So how do I figure out Okay, first of all, let's verify that that's actually the problem. I believe that it is, but we can go into uh, into basic. So this is the thing that's infinite looping, I think, right? No. Oh, this is a different stack trace printer. This is the one in runtime support. Oh God, we can't call print from here because it's runtime support. 
So I'm going to write the address, and then I'm going to write um, and I just want to verify that a node has itself as a next pointer. Yeah. So Default assertion failed has assert which has anonymous procedure as its own next. How does that happen? How does that happen? Any chives today? Nope. All right. What is my best option? I kind of don't understand how this could possibly be happening. Oh. No, it's because the, okay. Because this implementation of stack trace node, the compile time execution one, is wrong. So is that the place that's doing it, or is it a different place? That is the place that's doing it. So somebody else
Oh boy, this is the wrong. Uh oh, I bet when we're returning, we're like not popping the stack trace node. I don't know. We need to look for that. Okay, here in pop call record. I mean, that's fine, I guess. Oh, except no, guys. I think I wrote all this code before I changed the way that it works. See, it it works different. You call init stack trace node. Okay, and that's when we do it. And that's at the header of the target procedure. So I don't think we actually want to do this. Popping it. Oh, wait, no, 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 this part is fine, actually. Hold on. So this says, this makes the new node, it points it at the old node, but it doesn't actually set this. Right. So we've initted our stack trace node, which means we don't need to do this, actually. This is like the x64 version, right? So here we get we get a pointer to the stack trace, right? We load that Wait. No, that's setting that's doing this, right? which I don't think we actually need to do this, but okay.
Okay, we'll put that in the to-do loop. Um, we set the line number of the call. And we set on the context. So we do set the next pointer. So are we like not popping it for some reason? That seems to me like what's going on. Yeah. So why is that happening? Because I guess So here when we say pop call record, we're supposed to do this. So let's just say this is stupid, but sometimes that's what we're going to do. Setting next in the creation, then push, then pop, and apply the next to the old, and then redoing it. I I don't think I don't think you're quite following what it's supposed to be, but that's okay. It's a little bit for efficiency purposes. It's a little bit weird. Okay, we're pushing twice for some reason. Is it the same? Okay. Really?
Oh, wait. Compiler get command line arguments didn't pop. Say compiler function. And that goes through a different path. This is first, so, so this run compile time procedure is what that get command line arguments would go to. And we say pop the call record. Let's make sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's no um Yeah. So maybe we didn't set it. except it claims that we did. I want to make sure we called this function. Didn't. Was? Was? Okay, well, that gives me a thing to look at. What is the command compiler assert bug? Break there. Okay. So we're returning an empty array. Wait, what? I thought, did I not compile? What? 
Maybe this isn't the right call to compile or get command line arguments. Oh, wait, what? Bro, okay. The fault is that this shouldn't be running at all. Okay, okay. See, we did not correctly interact. See, these things should go to squeeze things. I mean, it looks messy, but there's no frickin' See, the stack trace node is a debugging level thing that you push for user level procedures and make this linked list out of, right? And we were pushing it at a time when it didn't make any sense. <laughs> Like, it's one of those, I'm amazed it didn't break way worse than that way earlier. Okay, this is the correct output because this looks like an error, but it's the user program signaling that error, right? So this, this whole thing that we were trying to debug was this thing is supposed to run, get the command line arguments, and assert that there's one argument, right? And it was going crazy. But if we do this, it won't error. Well, now it'll say there's no entry point, but that's fine. But if we do do two arguments, it'll error. Okay, that is the correct behavior, and we have fixed it. Now let's make sure that we didn't break 10 trillion other things. left an empty else. Did I? Did, where? Oh, in the in the print statement. Here we go. Okay. Can we run the game? Can we run the game? Oh yeah, this was your bug that you reported. See, we're trying to provide good bug fixing service. I could get hired for minimum wage at Adobe and I would be way better than anyone there at fixing bugs. Okay. Um, we're gonna run the tests in debug just so we could see oops just so we could see if they assert or whatever okay so the change log is going to be Fixed that stack trace nodes were incorrectly being pushed when compile compiler built ins were called, leading to poten infinite loops, infinite loops or other potential problems when using stack trace nodes with compile time execution. This is starting to be enough fixes to ship the beta, man. Beta max. Uh-oh. Oh, you know what? 
this um, <laughs> I was going to document so I started making a function for the here strings and uh, I guess I never tried to compile it how much is minimum wage in the states isn't it 575 or is it 750 I don't know what it is now Starting in February, it'll be 1795 once Joe Biden is president. You're surprised it's federally set. Um, there is a federal minimum wage that is not that high, and then a bunch of states impose higher minimum wages than the federal. Why stop at 1795? That's not a living wage. That's forty thousand dollars a year. It's almost that's almost medium pay in the US. He should make it thirty-five an hour, that's a decent wage. He should make it three hundred dollars an hour, then everybody will be rich. Why are politicians so stupid? Just make the minimum wage $300 an hour. Every single American will be like, just make tons of money. Everybody will be happy. It's so easy to solve these problems. Okay. Like what? It's like these people in office are stupid, you know? Did I leave anything dumb? Okay, this is actually false that this is used. So that's legit fix. That's oh, um, I just, you know, I don't like Unixy things. So when I first did the compiler, I was like, we're just sending everything to standard out because I think it's stupid, all this stream stuff. But there's no reason not to attempt to interoperate nicely. So, yeah. So we also did that. Great, we have fixed significant problems tonight. I've already did some off stream as well. But there's another one. Expand into any. I don't like the sound of that. Procedure call did not match hmm 
Okay. That doesn't seem that hard, actually. Let's just I mean, sometimes you could be surprised. So we're going to do this, and then I'm going to say like that should work, right? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. This isn't actually a bug. All right. If one lives left is still here, I can explain why this is not a bug. Um, this actually would be a good thing to document because it's something that people have asked about before. So, yeah. Okay, so the deal is the following. Um, in general, with this language, there's different philosophies that a programming language could take about, about automatic casting, right? Um, it could be that casting is usually like a lightweight operation, or it could be that maybe the compiler will invisibly do tons of work to convert one type to the other. And that's not what we try to do, right? We try to make casts for simple things. So if there's something that's not much computation and it's unambiguous what it should be, you know, then, then that could be an explicit cast or maybe even an implicit cast. But anything that's like, for example, highly subjective what the answer should be, then maybe you just have a function that converts from one to the other, right? That's the idea. This one isn't really that subjective, but it is like highly computational, so we don't do it. Um, what What's going on is, you know, if like this is an array of any, right? And any is a struct with a couple of members, right? So this is an array of structs, and this is an array of something else, and so to cast this to an array of any would be to iterate over this and cast each of these to an any. And and we just don't we don't do that, right? Is it's outside what the language does. Um it's similar to, you know, if you had a function that took an array of float 64s and you pass it an array of float 32s, it's like, okay, float 32s convert to float 64s. But like we don't do that on an array because it's a computationally heavy thing, right? Um, you know, you could make a to any function that you would put in there, um, but we don't we don't do that automatically. Should we do that automatically in certain cases? Maybe, right? Um, like, d definitely, um, that's a thing that we can think about, uh, but. You know, we're, we're trying to stay in a place where the compiler doesn't surprise you by doing a lot more work than you thought it was, right, at runtime. Um, what else can I say about this? It is a little bit like the way that we explain any in the beginning how-to docs is kind of like magical, right? Like, I'm not sure that beginners understand the difference between this and this. Like, I try to explain it, but it's it's different, right? Um, or let's make it simpler, right? I don't think that beginners necessarily understand the difference between these two things. Um, when in fact, this is quite different, right? So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's not a bug. It's deliberately outside what we do right now. Um, in general, we don't like the compiler doesn't do any kind of, uh, 
big vector operation, right? So like you can't take an array of U8s and cast it to an array of U32s, right? Or the other way around. We, we just don't do that. Any feels like a special case where it is more agreeable about being cast to than everything else. Yeah, I mean, I totally know what you're saying there. Um, like the whole the whole point of any, th this is one reason why I might think about making an exception for this at some point. Um, the whole point of any is that you're being just easy about things and maybe a little bit slow, right? Because it's making these structs to like wrap the data values and stuff. So um, I kind of could see that. On the other hand, because arrays are all of the same type of element anyway, auto converting to an array of any is massively wasteful because you're taking a hundred things and making structs with a hundred pointers that all say the same type, <laughs> right? Um, because it's not possible to have an array of heterogeneous types. So that, that would be a reason not to do it because like, eh, eh, you know. <laughs> Any comes up in the docs before it's explained. Yeah, there's like, I think a bunch of things are gonna need to get reordered eventually just because, um, you know, it's not being, the documents are not being written linearly. Right. So no any array. You can make an any array. Um, but I'm just saying a non because it's a very strongly typed language, right? Any array that's not an array of any is def is definitively all everything is of the same type, right? So anytime you converted that to an array of any, the any's are kind of a waste right? Because they're not telling you any more information. The, the different elements can't be anything. You could make an array of any that are all different types. That's, that's why you can do this, right? It's just you can't meaningfully get that from this. <laughs> you can't make an any array with the literal syntax. Um, I think you could. I think you could. I think you can do the following. Oh, no, because the problem is you can write it and it's kind of semantically correct, but once you cast to any, that's not a constant anymore, and then the array element won't be constant. But will the compiler correctly barf on it? I don't know. So let's go uh, A is any dot one two hello right like that kind of would work but won't work yeah um it's a little bit of a i think a beginner might be confused by this error message because it's like what do you mean it it is a literal right but it, it, it's actually not a literal because it's being cast to any and and any is a runtime value We could, like, there's no such thing as a as an any literal. We could actually do that. <laughs> we could have there be such a thing as an any literal because the type information is available in the executable and, you know, it could point at somewhere in static space. It's just, that's really annoying and we just have too many better things to do right now. So I would rather have it just be a runtime value always. Honestly, I think, again, this comes down to, I don't think the name any is very good, right? Because you just sort of think of it like, oh, I could pass any type here and it just works, right? Whereas if it was called like wrapper 
or you know box or something then you're like oh this is actually a thing that has storage and property of its own right so i think i do want to change the name like at some point these things become less become less surprising if the name is different a little bit Any is kind of a bone to throw to more dynamic type oriented programmers. Or a serious way to do it would struct union using place. Um, I mean, the thing about a union is you would also need to need to put a type tag on it, right? Like that's what I do. Yeah, like I almost never use any's in my own program's data structures because you don't really want that, right? Like what any is for is just, if you wanna be able to call a function with various types, um, but you don't, you don't want the function to be polymorphic. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just a, a fully runtime way of giving you a little bit more flexibility on what, what you pass to a function. That's really the main use. For thing, you know, for things like the print function, like I, I actually, I don't know if I say this in the how to. I think I possibly do, but like, you know, the print function can take, you know, seventeen arguments or whatever. I, imagine it didn't. Imagine it just took three fixed arguments. You have some function that takes three arguments always, but you want them to be any type, right? If you polymorph that, you have possibly a large a large number of different implementations of that function. And the function has to be really careful about what the types of the arguments are in terms of its code. And that, that could get, you need to like static if a lot of things and it could get crazy, right? Whereas if there are any's, you don't care because it's all runtime, right? And you don't have a trillion copies of the function. So there's trade-offs to doing it each way. Name it shipping container, okay. Do we have anything like traits in Rust? I don't know what traits in Rust are. I don't know why people expect me to know these things. Trait is the most generic, unmeaningful word, and every modern programming language uses it to mean something different. And it's like, what I'm supposed to, you expect me to know what this means? It, do, it doesn't mean anything. The word trait has no connotations. Traits is simply an interface that any struct can implement. So it's an interface. Why don't they call it interface? Um, I don't, so I don't um, have a clear enough picture of how that works to answer the question, unfortunately. Like I would need, I would need an example of what how you, what you would do with it and how you would do it. I mean, there is there, there is interface style duck typing, yeah. Like uh, I could show you guys an example. We were talking about this one the other day on the Discord. So like, here's some matrix functions, right? And so let's look for something. OK, so if you want to transform a point by a vector or by a point by a matrix, um, it could be it could be a four by three matrix. It could be a, a four by four matrix, right? Or it could be something funky that has a four by three embedded in it. Um, I forget what the other, there were actually three things. Anyway, so what this says is, well, anything matching matrix four by three, right? 
or any matrix 4x3. Whereas any matrix 4x3, it just lists these components and it says, look, we need these things, right? So this is like a duck typing match where it says, look, anybody who has these variables that are of these types, we're okay with. We can, we can, this procedure can act on that. Um, but the, the data doesn't have to be stored in any particular format like it would have to be if it was like inheritance or something, right? Like if somebody inherited from any matrix three. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry, any matrix four by three was this one that we were looking at, but there's an any matrix three, which is, which is what, uh, well, transform vector was using that. So any matrix three includes like four by three, four by four and three by three, right? So that's kind of the equivalent of C++ concepts or a significant part of C++ concepts, which I guess is called traits in Rust, I don't know. How about any matrix one? Sure, I mean, but a scalar wouldn't be in any matrix one. <laughs> because this is literally just about structs that have certain members. Right. So here's an any matrix two, for example. Any matrix one would just be one, one. It's just we don't have any functions that operate on that. Interface in Go, traits in Rust, Rust is terrible syntax and naming. Well, interfaces in Go are actually a little different, right? Interfaces in Go are a runtime construct, aren't they? Like, like if you pass a struct into something that takes an interface, the interface is itself a different struct and it like fills out the members, right? Do we have operator and function overloading? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. 30 month streak. That's crazy. It's almost like I've been making this programming language for 30 months, but that's, that couldn't be true. Mm. That couldn't possibly be true. Go has the same automatic name matching but with functions instead of members. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is something that different languages have some kind of, right? Okay, um, well, this is great that we fix that bug, I think. Since that other thing isn't a bug, it's a won't fix. <laughs> um, I think maybe we turn into let's documenting. And then maybe tomorrow I ship the beta. Could ship the beta now, but I want to I want to get more documenting in. We want to talk about these, the print function, the thing we were just talking about. Let's, let's, let's documenting. I am getting a little tired already. Guys, I don't, I honestly don't know where today went. Hold on. We got it. Uh oh, Chaco is doing a watch party. Let's see. Let's see what the watch party is. Con hair. <laughs> okay, I saw that in the theater. Okay. Um. 
No, we're just in time to see somebody spit something out. That was great. That didn't sound enthusiastic enough. Okay, better. Better. Okay. Which one of these? I guess we'll go to the array thing. Okay, before we do that, no, it wasn't. Oh, we were going to do here strings. Let's do that. That's easy. Let me make sure that I didn't document here strings in a later file. Nope, we just use it later. Okay. Okay. So we want to talk about the backslashing and then the... Okay. You surely noticed all the weird... Backslash N inside the strings being passed to the print function. This is a special character um, um, copied from C's tradition that means new line. There are some other special characters, all of which there are, it's not just other special characters, but ways that you do. Okay. All of which you can put into a, you can designate with a backslash. They are <coughs> stuff. And then what if you actually want a backslash in a string, not a special character? Just as in C, you can do this by writing two backslashes. Uh, 
maybe going on maybe to noob level. No, I mean, you need to document these things or people won't know. Um, <clears throat> like, you know, somebody who knows can just skim over this and it's fine, right? Oh yeah, I get backslashes. They just don't even have to read it. But someone who doesn't needs to have a place to find the information. And also, even if you know about backslashing, it's useful to know in this language these specific codes that are accepted. All right, let's actually do this this way so that okay. So we have backslash r, right? Which is like, I don't even remember what that is. Some of these we decided not to do. So we have n, r, we have t, tab, right? What is backslash r? Right, I think it could be upper or lower case. Get hex digit. Yep. See, like this particular specific information is not something that people are necessarily going to know. Windows uh, carriage return. Yeah. Okay. I don't actually know if I want to encourage that. Yeah. See, this is helpful documentation, right?
How many hex digits is capital U? It's eight. Is that how you write these U plus whatevers? Yeah, we don't do octal. Yeah, there's no octal. The problem with octal in C is that it's just a leading zero, which is a valid decimal number. So I have actually, because I never use octal in C, I have actually sometimes said, oh, I want a three-digit decimal number here, so I'll put a leading zero. <laughs> and then my code breaks because it's in a different base, and I'm like, what? And then I remember about octal. <laughs> so there is no 64-bit Unicode. Yeah there, yeah, there is. Um, I mean, there's more than 32. You thought it hadn't broken 21 bits yet. Um, that's certainly not true. There are Unicode characters uh, above above 2 to the 32. Absolutely there are. Oh wait, right. No, you're right. Hold on. I've got that, I've got, sorry, I've got all my bits multiplied by 2. You're right, because of the hex digits is half a byte thing. No, you're correct. There are Unicode characters that are more than 4 hex digits. Yes, my brain broke for a second. This is 16-bit character, and this is 32-bit. OK. Um, like, my these variables were wrong, and that's why I got confused. Oh, I actually lied here and said it has to be, okay, we do error. That's actually better. You know what? I was looking at the code and saying, oh, it's lenient about how many digits, but you actually do. It'll complain if you don't use all of them. Except for decimal. Use the teacup Unicode character U plus one F three seven five. Really? It looks like a loaf of green bread. Why is that a Unicode character? God, that's so offensive. All right. Talk about lack of adult supervision. Okay.
Okay, so that was called backslash codes. Let's actually let's end this comment here and we'll go Redeclaration to variable s. Oh, format int. Okay. How's that? What happens if you use a single backslash in an unrecognized escape sequence? Do you mean... Like that? That probably should be an error, honestly. We'll get a warning. Does it work? Um, I believe what it'll do is just put the question mark, or maybe it puts both. Let's see.
Oh, it just puts the question mark. Beginner may get bit by D22 two, two over 2,2. Two. You like that it's D for decimal and X for hex. Yeah, well, there is no back, like backslash 2,2 two is just going to be an error. There's no, right, or a warning, right? So they'll know, they'll know that it was wrong if they put backslash 2,2. Two, two. Also, though, that's not a thing a beginner is going to do. Beginners are not going to put numerically coded characters into their strings. the copy and pasting this <laughs> that could be be good to go over what percent doesn't print yeah totally that's a different file though because this one is just strings and there'll be a separate file for uh, print but I don't think I'm gonna do it tonight I think we're gonna do the strings file and then call it a night because it's going on midnight here okay in the string you want to use. This becomes especially bad when your string contains code because code itself has Okay, so we need a backslash, a backslash, a backslash, a backslash, 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 backslash.
Does anyone have an IDE where you like right click on the string to like collapse this stuff down? That seems like an IDE. But what is the use case for encoded characters inside of a string if the normal characters are printed anyway? Um, what do you mean? You mean like those hex characters that I did? Like if you're going to do an escape sequence, for example, like for, you know, console color control, like I want to switch to red. That's specific color codes that you would use. Most IDEs do that. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't even know if I got this right. Honestly. Did I? I don't. It seems like too many backslashes, but. Well, there we go. <laughs> Instead of having such a rabid, rabid backslash party, we can instead use an alternate form of writing strings. Inherited from um, let's not put that yet, that'll confuse. Including new lines um, is put into So for example, Um, this is a little bit funny, right? So now actually let's call it the same thing uh, fourth time Because of the meta programming element, we can get rid of all the backslashes. I mean, 
I'm sort of like this is the example that I should lead with. Because this is very clear. Of course, Emacs is now very confused <laughs> about what's going on because it doesn't know. Oh, um. And then, of course, there's this question of white space, which is right now we actually just put all the white space, which is a decision we might change later. But I think for now, we're just going to keep it. Okay, let's do this. Note that the quotes and backslashes are very clean. They are just what we wanted to print. Why are we going out to the left column in that unindented, ugly way? It's because the contents of the string are 100% verbatim, including leading spaces. We might change this eventually, but for now, this is the simplest thing that leaves the least doubt about what is going on, even if it's ugly. And I'm just not going to do, I don't know if I want to. Yeah, like some languages, I forget what Python does. Python has some version of this, or maybe it's not Python. Someone has some version of this where they use the first lines indentation or something, right? But then like, what if there's a mixture of tabs and spaces? I guess you make tabs illegal. I don't know. It's not totally that simple, right? If you put the second done on the same line as a string, will it leave out the new line? Yes. Or wait. No. I should bring that up. It's actually, it has to be a line that starts with that identifier. Python has triple tick, and the way white space works is that inconsistency in white space is a parsing error in any circumstance, I see. But it's not just inconsistency in white space. It's that that, it's that, that white space that is consistent is also not included in the string, right?
we could actually do that because we we reserved we reserved single quote so we actually could change that syntax okay um You think the string prefixes are B double quote for bytes or, or B triple tick? You think the string prefixes are really nice syntax? Well, I don't agree. B for bytes, R for raw strings, no escape. I don't understand the meaning of those things. You've only just realized right now that you can't use a here string without a trailing new line. Yeah, that's true. Um, that is a thing that we might put in an option for or something, right? Um, So we could have it be, you know, we could let you just put that identifier. The trailing new line, you can do it in code by for representing ASCII strings when Python 3 made all strings Unicode by default. I don't even know what that means. All these things you guys are saying, I have no idea what any of this means. It sounds way too complicated. Sounds like Python strings are really complicated. Can you declare strings without escape sequences or rather ignore them? What do you mean you? What would that even mean? You get to choose the byte encoding, but like UTF-8 is the same as ASCII, except for non-printable ASCII characters anyway. Like, unless you're talking about like screwed up Windows 16-bit Unicode or whatever. Okay, anyway, this might be a good candidate for an overhaul 
like now that we have enough people in the beta community, if we could come up with some version of this that's nicer, maybe it's just controlling the indentation and how you decide, like maybe you could put this anywhere, maybe you could put it here and that would mean no new line. Um, yeah, but right now I'm just documenting the way it is right this second. And I think that's it. I think that is enough. Python uses UTF-16. That's a bad choice. Can you have comment inside the string? Yes, you can. That's worth pointing out. We need more enthusiasm. What is escape sequence for percent? Uh, well, that's a different thing, right? So that's a print function thing and not a string thing. And because of that, it's percent percent because backslash percent wouldn't like that would just mean put a percent in the string, but the print function is what's interpreting the string. It's a different, like we should definitely cover that, why that's that way in the print function routine, uh, how to, but yeah, it's not, it's not the same system. It's easy to, to conflate them, but it's not the same system. Maybe add a qualifier like done compact, which leads to reading, leading and trailing. Yeah, totally. Last time you saw me print a percent character. No, you just use percent percent. It's fine. Can you comment out part of hash string so it's not included? No, you cannot. If you wanted a string with double brackets, bracket equal bracket, what if you want a string with both of those things? <laughs> like what if you want a string that's just got some Lua code that uses both of those things in it? 
Good luck. <laughs> it was some time ago. Yeah, I mean, there might have been a time when I didn't actually support percent percent. <laughs> that might have been a thing. Then two equal signs. What if you want a two equal sign? What if you... <laughs> How do you have adjacent things print if percent is... Everybody asks this, which is why we need to write the how-to. You can number the arguments. You can say percent one, percent two, percent three, right? So to do that, you just say percent one, percent two, or whatever the argument numbers are. Um, they don't have to be in order. So when you internationalize strings, right? Sometimes you want to swap things around, and you can do that just fine. Yeah. Um, that definitely needs to get documented, because um, it is a common question. Uh, I'm not going to do it tonight, though, because I'm starting to get tired. I don't know where today went. I woke up, I got breakfast, I came back, I did a little bit of, like, you know company running money stuff and then I did a meeting and then I went to coffee and got a little programming done and then I went to dinner like I don't the day day is gone man does that work for reasoning a value yes you can do that Flying day. Ugh. Oops. How to slash O five strings. Look at these things that we have done for next beta. What if you have to need to insert a percent one, but have a one right after it, and you are sending in 11 variables? Yeah, for that one, there's. What would you do in that case? We kind of need... Well, not need, but if we wanted to handle that, you would have a percent code that actually contracts to the empty string. So like, maybe if you said percent zero, because we start at one for some reason, like, I don't know why, because it's a programmer language, so maybe it should start at zero, but then we'd have to change every single piece of code that exists. Um, like maybe if you say percent zero, it's the empty string, right? Did you explain delimiting and identifier? I believe I did. With braces, no, I don't want to put braces. Because then you have to let people escape the braces if they want to use braces, like it's, it's nutty. You just want to use percent right before a one. Well then, Oh, right. Yeah. Same thing. Um, right now, you have to insert the one <laughs> into the string. But yeah, if we had something that collapses to empty string, then you would be able to do that. However, our exact access does x is dot dot dollar sign t make x just be an array of t? Yes, it is a it is exactly what you wrote. 
exactly. Then percent percent one would work. No, that wouldn't work because he's saying. I thought he was saying use percent without a number to access the first variable or whichever one's next, but then put a one after it, right? Percent percent, we'll just put a percent sign. It's different. Okay, well, we documented, we fixed bug. What did I do on Lexer? Uh oh. Great. Just keeping the train rolling. Do you use any for other things in Varg? Sometimes. I would say the most common use is Vargs, but um, you can you can use it as a single thing. Any other like questions? I'm gonna go to bed soon, but um, I really have not slept that well at this hotel. It's been, this trip has been like a zigzag of sleeping pretty well, not sleeping. There's like a really loud train that goes by early in the morning, like, and honks its horn really loud, like, uh, come on guys. Time for a new hotel. It is time for a new hotel. I check out tomorrow. Checking out. Have I been traveling for speaking engagements? No, I am traveling to escape California. The evil state where I was born. Ah. I'm having a good trip though. F? Is that an actual F or is that an F for California? Drop frames 149. How long until California hits bottom? I think it'll take a while. Like someone was showing the map of San Francisco voting against Prop 22, and it was like most of San Francisco. It was terrible. So they, they deserve what they're going to get, man. That's all I can say. Remember one of William Gibson's books put a big divide between North and South California? Is that a thing these days? It is not, not really. I mean, it's just, San Francisco is just really far from Los Angeles. So there's a geographic divide. Like people from the Eastern part of the United States don't understand how big California is, <laughs> all right? California is really big. Any plan to put more videos on YouTube? You know, I, I sort of put things on YouTube when they make especially like, here's a nice encapsulated, we did something specific, maybe it was very visual or maybe it was a very well-defined task and we cranked on it. And I just haven't done streams of that form for a while. So I just kind of haven't felt like it. Am I making progress picking a new place to live? Um, I mean, I'm making progress. Like there are places where I could live for a while and not be sad about it. Um, but like there's not been anywhere that's like, yeah, this is it. I'm going. I'm for sure going.
enjoyed the critique of the rust entity talk yeah that was a very off the cuff like i didn't even prepare it or think about it but it came out pretty well considering any idea when i do it will do more talks i've just got so much work to do right now it'll be a while like i have no concrete plans for that how am i liking teardown i just couldn't play it it was ran too slowly on this laptop but that was maybe with the wrong GPU, so we're going to have to try it again with the other GPU, um, maybe tomorrow or something. Did I vote? I voted to stay away from any polling place. Any interest in voxel technology? I mean, what's the technology part exactly? Because there are different, there every once in a while there's like some rendering system where some guys like, I solved all problems of computer graphics with voxels, right? And those are usually scams. Well, they're pretty much always scams, or, you know, people who don't have enough context in actual rendering to know what people do when they render. So those are never very good. Um, I mean, there are like voxel-based games and stuff, though, that look really cool and have their own engines that run voxels, and those are those are nice. So it, it sort of depends on which category of things you're talking about. Am I going to participate in or even just attend Handmade Seattle? I, I'm just so busy. I don't know. I don't go to conferences. <laughs> I don't go to conferences generally. The last time I've been to a conference as an attendee Well, I mean, I did one in 2020, but it was a very special small conference that I was invited to, and it was an invite only special thing, but like something that's not one of those. Um, actually, okay, it wasn't that long ago because a couple years ago, I went to GDC for the first time in five years, just as a regular attendee to see if I was missing anything and I, I wasn't. So it actually hasn't been that long, but it's very rare. It's very rare. Very few times in the last 10 years have I gone to a conference as an attendee. Because it's just at some point you kind of age out of conferences. You kind of experience out of conferences. It's like, do I want to go to this thing or would I rather be just putting that time into working on my projects and getting done the valuable things that I could do with that time. And the answer is almost always that second one. If I had to write a program to compute a place to move to, is that even possible? I mean, probably not a high quality one because what you actually care about is probably not that quantifiable. Or I guess it's not that it's quantifiable or not, but it's like the data that you would find about all the cities or places to live if you value outside city would not contain the information that you would need to make the judgment, right? Probably. I did go to a handmade one and it was a good watch. Yeah, but that was not as an attendee. That was um, me being there. 
I went to two of the handmaids. Um, I went to the most recent one was I went to the job table at maybe that was the first one that Abner ran. I don't know. Um, and I just talked to people at the job table. Uh, and then before that, of course, there was the one that Casey did where uh, I was an interviewee. Right. But that's not that's not going to attend the conference. It's like going to to do the interview. Right. I mean, I've gone to lots of conferences. Like I spoke at like seven conferences last year or something. So I'm not saying I don't go to conferences. I'm saying I go to them for a different reason. I go there to give a speech or something, right? I don't think it was seven. Was it five last year? I don't even know. It was, it was significant. Do I prefer to deliver my ideas through speech or writing? I haven't done that much writing lately, so I don't know. I mean, we're writing these how-tos, and it's different, but I don't know that I can compare them very readily. All right, I'm going to go to bed, everybody. Thank you for coming by. So let's find somebody who is doing some programming. Um, whoops. Uh, yeah, I'm not a very social person who's good in social situations, so I don't really go to conferences to meet people because I don't really end up meeting anyone. And, I mean, I had this problem for a while where, uh, we'll do Go Compiler, where, you know, after being an indie game, the movie and stuff, like, I'm not that social. But I had this thing where lots of people wanted to talk to me because I was in Indie Game the movie and I was in the PlayStation 4 launch announcement and stuff. Like, and I'm just not one of the people who likes to do that. I don't, I don't like that kind of attention. It's, it's, I'm not comfortable in those situations, and I would rather just be talking to people I know. So that was that was probably when I stopped going to conferences very much. And then even when I would go somewhere to speak, I would sort of hide and then give the speech and then go back to hiding. Because <laughs> um, I just, I didn't like it. All right, thanks everybody. I'll see you later. The raid is counting down. <laughs>